Hey everybody, welcome back to Jim's Garage. In this video, we're talking about MyroTalk. It could be the perfect drop-in replacement for things like Teams and Google Meet, and it's open source, freely available, and you can share this with pretty much as many users as you have bandwidth for. It has a number of collaboration tools. You can do full screen recording. It's got chat, folder sharing, file sharing, and all of those sorts of things. It's extremely simple to use with a deliberately easy user interface. You can simply join a room, select your inputs, and then you're off to the races. You can invite people simply with a QR code or a link, and you don't have to have any authentication on there to make things easy, albeit you can add authentication as well if you want. So we're gonna be installing this using Docker and putting it behind our good old trusty reverse proxy. And by the end of this video, you'll have a similar setup whereby you can use your own self-hosted voice and video conferencing tool to connect with whoever you want to do, safe in the knowledge that nobody's gonna be spying on what you say or what you do. So to get this up and running, I've headed over to my Docker virtual machine and we're gonna go through the compose file. Now, the first thing to talk about is we're using the P2P container. There are other models that we can use. The P2P uses WebRTC, which means that each client can connect uniquely to each other. That's good for both end-to-end -end encryption between all clients, albeit there is a different model that you can implement if you want to do sort of more of a traditional hub and spoke, where each person connects directly to the server and the server is in control of doing all of the connections, i.e. it can broadcast out. That might be an option if you're wanting to spin this up in say a small medium enterprise, but for a home lab space, I think doing the peer-to-peer -peer route is probably the best option. Now, thankfully, all we need is a single container for MyroTalk to work, and we'll be going through that now. So whilst this Docker Compose file is pretty much all you need to configure, there is also a .env, an environment file, which we will go through as well. So let's have a look at the Docker Compose. So we're pulling down the latest version of the peer-to-peer -peer container for MyroTalk. It expects the environment variable file to be accessible. So I'm simply running this, you'll see it here on the left. I've got the .env in the same folder as my Docker Compose, and you know that because it's got a .env file. It's in the same directory. Now you can add some additional folders here, so the .app and .public, and these can be useful if you're wanting to do things like screen share recording and uploading files and folders. So if you are wanting to do that, just link those here. We're gonna restart this container unless stopped, so that hopefully it should always be available. Because I'm putting this behind my proxy, I'm gonna put it on my proxy network, which I've set up earlier in a previous traffic video. If you're not wanting to use this reverse proxy, simply comment this out and add the ports. Then you could just use the traditional IP and port method. For the labels for traffic, it's pretty straightforward. Nothing here is different from any of my previous videos. The only thing here is that I've stipulated port 3000. That's the default port that MyroTalk operates on. And you'll see in a moment in the environment file, you can actually change this if you want to. Obviously, if you change it, you'll need to change it here. And you'd obviously need to change it here, albeit because it's using an environment variable, it should pick that up from the environment variable anyway. So I told you it was pretty simple. Let's move on to the environment file. So in the environment file, we need to choose a domain. So you don't actually need to change this because traffic can take care of it, but you might want to change it from localhost and put your actual domain name in. So for me, jimsgarage.co.uk. You can specify the port that you want this to run on. By default, it's 3000. I don't have any port conflicts on 3000. Plus, it's kind of a moot point because I'm putting it behind a reverse proxy anyway, so I'm not actually opening the port up on my host. Now, I'm not doing HTTPS. That might make you wonder why. That's because, again, we're putting this behind our reverse proxy. The SSL termination will take place at the proxy, and therefore any backend traffic will be sent from the proxy to the container. If you don't have a proxy, MyroTalk can take care of the certificates for you, but you will need to set this to true, and you'll need to do some additional configuration. I don't really see much benefit of doing it that way. Perhaps maybe in a bespoke VPS with a broadcast service you might want to, albeit it still makes sense to put this behind a reverse proxy. Especially when you consider that this is going to be internet facing 
And with that, you can do something like CrowdSec and put that in front. So at least you get some additional scanning, security features, etc. Now the time zone, change that to where you are. I've put on both the debug and I've made the debug logs be in color, which is quite helpful. Next, you'll need to get onto the cores. Now, I'm just leaving this as the default, but you'll have noticed in my previous videos, you can actually restrict cores to only use the subdomains that require access. Now, I've left this as any for now, which isn't the most secure, but it's more secure than not having anything in here because we've limited it to only get and post requests. You can also do IP whitelisting if you wanted to. By default, that's left as false. But if you wanted to set it to true, you could obviously restrict this to the IP addresses that you want to. I prefer to do this through other means. So for example, network policies in Kubernetes, or you can even do IP whitelists on traffic itself. You can do it on also other proxies, and you can also do it obviously on your firewall. So there's a myriad of layers you could put in ahead of this, and it's always a good idea to put your preventative controls further outside the application you're getting to, i.e. you want layers of defense. Now, as I mentioned before, we can actually tie this in to something that supports OpenID. One of those, for example, could be authentic. Now, all we need to do is configure this to use authentic, much like I've done in many of my previous videos. It's probably a good idea to have some form of authentication and authorization. Therefore, you will know who connected, when they connected, etc. You'll have all of those logs. And so if you did want to use something like authentic, you would need to set up the OIDC for that. So enable that to true. Set the endpoint for your OIDC provider, the base URL for MyroTalk itself, Get the ID and the secret, which you can get from going into Authentic and creating a wizard. Here you'll see I've set one up. But you get all this by going through the create the wizard, choosing what you want to do, choosing the type, and then it will give you those credentials. And you can find that out in a previous video I've done around Authentic. Once you've got that, you can obviously then head on. So we've got things like host protection. This basically adds another layer of protection whereby you need to be in a separate list. So you'll see here the host users list. So up to you if you want to do it. It does state that when OIDC is enabled, the bit we've just done here, along with host protection, again, you'll have to be recognized then as valid. And when set to true, it also requires a valid username and password. So you've got kind of a double authentication there. I'm going to leave that off because I'm going to let the OIDC take care of it. That's enough protection for me. Next, you can specify the Java web token and make any changes you want to here. The next section gives you the notion of presenters. Here you'll see the guy who created it. And basically, this is a pre-approved list of people who will join rooms and have the privileges of a presenter, i.e. they can do the screen sharing, they can do a presentation. Otherwise, you'll have to request that or be granted it through the application before you can start presenting. NGROC is a simple way to basically proxy your service using an out-of-the-box tool. We're not going to be using that because we're using traffic for this one. Stun servers. So the stun servers are set up to facilitate the WebRTC protocol. So this enables people to share basically their true IP address. So we're just using the Google one for this, albeit you could set up your own stun server if you wanted to and use that, but I don't really see much point in that. The turn is enabled, so we've got a turn server. So what's actually gonna happen here is this will relay it through this connection here. So effectively, if it can't make a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection, it will route your traffic through a turn server. Now, if you've got your privacy hat on, you might wish to change this and you might want to spin up your own turn server. That means that all the traffic will basically be routed through your endpoint. But if you're not too concerned about that, you can obviously use a public one, but just note that your traffic could be routed through that. If, for example, one of the clients is unable to make a direct connection to you and you can't make a direct connection to them through e.g. firewall rules, etc. Now, if people do want a video on stun and turn servers, I can do that. Let me know in the description below. But it's kind of a moot point in some respects, deploying this on your own infrastructure. If the client can't connect directly to you and you can't directly connect to them, 
hosting the same turn server on the same infrastructure is going to yield the same results. Your best bet is to put this turn server in something like a VPS, like I've described previously using things like Oracle, and you could probably get away with a very low powered, low cost cloud infrastructure to get that up and running. And thankfully, if you follow the description links here, you can either go to the official one or follow the documentation for this project. It's a simple Docker Compose file that you can deploy in the cloud and that should get you up and running pretty quickly. After that, we've got the IP lookup. So that will try to peer the IP to where they are geolocally. If people are coming over a VPN, obviously that's not gonna make too much sense. In the next section, you can spin up your secret key, which is a good idea to change that. I've set the survey enabled to true to help these guys out, but you can obviously disable that if you want. You can redirect users after they've left the room so you can take them back to the homepage if you wanted to, or perhaps a different page within your organization. Next, we get onto some of the custom integrations. So you can tie this in with Sentry, Slack, ChatGPT, etc and that will give you additional integrations within the application itself things like chat gpt might be useful if you want to get some semi-accurate answers to some of your questions while you're doing chats smtp is a good idea to configure i won't be doing that in this video because i've done it before but essentially go to your email provider look for the smtp settings and put them in here what that will do is then enable you to send out messages to your users, password resets, authentication, all that sort of stuff. Lastly, we've got some statistics. If you want to send those anonymously off, you can do. One final thing I do want to touch on is if we do go back to the Docker Compose file, if we now do create this application folder, so let's delete that and get it in line. Say we have the dot slash app, what we can actually do in there is put in some additional configuration predominantly for things like the front end. So on the JavaScript that runs the page we saw earlier with me talking, we can actually change things. So if you wanted to disable recording, for example, you could quite crudely just remove the button for doing that and then people wouldn't be able to record sessions, etc. Anyway, let's jump into the deployment and let's get this thing up and running. So let's fire up the terminal and then let's get this up and running. So if I navigate to the folder I need to be in, it should be as simple as a docker compose up dash D. This is gonna go away and pull the image and hopefully we should have this deployed. Good thing is it's a pretty lightweight image so it only takes a few seconds to actually deploy this. So now that's created and if we go back to here, you'll see that I've created the myrotalk-docker, just so it doesn't conflict with uh, my existing one, that we can add now to our DNS resolver, and hopefully we should be able to access that page. So hitting that, we're now into a room, and then hopefully we can click join room. And we need to allow my camera, allow my microphone, give myself a name and then I've joined the meeting. You can now obviously share this with whoever you want to simply by sharing the URL provided you've got all the port forwards and DNS records in place. And if you want to see that with an OIDC provider like Authentic, I made a couple of changes to the configuration file. I basically had to update the issuer base URL just to this one here, which you can get from Authentic itself. Don't worry, I'll be adding those to my GitHub anyway. But if you did wonder where they're from, you just need to go into Authentic and you can find things here like the issuer configuration. So now when we actually deploy this and run it, it's gonna go, hey, Authentic, and then you can't even access the server until you're logged in. It's gonna ask me for my password. Once I've given it my password, you're about to sign in, so let's click continue. And fingers crossed, yeah, I'm now logged in as myself. I can join this room, allow, allow. And again, give it a name, and then I'm in. And now anybody else who wants to come into the server, they'll obviously have to have an account and it'll be protected through something like Authentic or any other OIDC provider. So now we're in here and I'm actually recording off the session itself. You can open up things like your chat channel, have a look at that. You can do some whiteboarding, which is pretty cool. So you can draw some shapes to people. 
You can share files, pretty straightforward. You can do picture in picture mode, all those sorts of things. And when you open up the settings, you can actually see that it supports officially 8K out of the gate, which is ludicrous, but effectively there's no compromise on the quality. It's basically gonna be your webcam, basically gonna be your web camera and some compression. So hopefully that was a useful demonstration of MiroTalk and it's given you the confidence to go and spin this up for yourself. Now I've previously touched on things like Jitsi Meet, which are possibly a bit more popular and established in the marketplace, but I do love the simplicity of MiroTalk. It's a single compose, just with an environment file, that I can basically spin up, deploy and have up and running in a heartbeat. Anyway, let me know if this is something you're interested in, whether it's something you're going to deploy, drop a comment below. As always, if you've liked this video, give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody.